Welcome, friends. Today we're gonna talk about video game cover art. In the modern day, cover art is so optimized that you don't even really think much about it anymore. But back in the day, cover art for games was all over the place. So let's have a look. First, we've got those games that don't look anything at all like their cover art. Like this game for the NES, Demon Sword. It's got like a Conan the Barbarian sort of vibe, but it's actually a very Eastern-inspired ninja-looking game. Something like this would have made a lot more sense. And actually, these games look a whole lot alike. And they're even made by the same people. Okay, so we all know about Bomberman, right? This is what the first Bomberman game on the NES looks like. And then here he is on that NES game's cover art. I think he looks a lot like Samus right here. And then here we got the Famicom art, where he looks completely different again as well. And with Bomberman 2, they decided to just draw him normal. But the NES version is still trying to play it up and look epic. And then we've got Bomberman Act Zero, where he's a terrorist. But to be fair, this one isn't misleading you. That game actually looks like this. And then there's this masterpiece for the Turbo Graphics, where he looks like an off-brand Dollar General Mortal Kombat ninja. Since we're talking about characters that don't look like their cover, we have to talk about that classic Mega Man art. You already knew it was gonna be here. This is a prime example of how they would try to present a lot of stuff that got localized in America. In Japan, he was just depicted like you would expect, and then the PAL version went so hard. Why didn't we get this one? But that Mega Man 2 cover does make this guy look cool. And then the PAL version went to like the Wizard of Oz or something for Mega Man 2. The German one is pretty sick. It like crosses the divide between epic and classic. And by the reign of Mega Man the Third, they got it all sorted out. They still trying to make it look like a Hollywood production though. Localizers wouldn't dare put a cartoon character on anything if they could help it. But this PAL version art is horrifying. They really love putting the Doctor back there. The PAL art went so hard that they brought it back when they started making these again. Mega Man 9 and 10 got the spice, but I guess the pantry was empty when they made Mega Man 11. Okay, so we all remember Pac-Man, but have you seen him on this box art? There's a lot of different directions that they've taken the Pac-Man design, but this is truly special. Like it rides a different bus special. Some of the Pac-Man clones also ride that bus. Like Jelly Monsters, or Crunch Factory. How about Ghost Chaser for the Amiga? Why does he have a gun though? Looks a little rapey. He's gonna get a piece of that ghost for sure. And Dot Gobbler looks like he's about to get convicted. What did you do? I like how this one is just called Oh Shit. Our guy looks a lot like Winnie the Pooh. I bet this game is banned in China. And then this one is just called Shit. It's the same game actually. But what's really funny about this one is that they ripped it straight off the cover of this horror novel. But that's not the only game guilty of stealing art. Here we got the beloved first Metal Gear game. And then here's a shot from the first Terminator movie. Looks a lot like a traceover to me. Somehow knowing this makes me appreciate both of these things in a way that I didn't before. Aren't there some parallels between Terminator and Metal Gear though? So like this is actually really fitting. How about Contra? So that's Arnold in the first Predator movie. And that's pretty great, especially because they got the alien back there too. But who's this other guy? Surely he's gotta be drawn from a movie still too. And sure enough, he's from the same movie. Excellent. All right, so the Contra 3 cover art goes hard, but here's the Japanese cover for this game. And then this is the cover of the movie Raw Deal. Arnold sure is on a lot of NES titles. He's also in games on other consoles too. It certainly looks like he's on the cover of this Amiga game. I mean, here's the cover of Commando. How about Crime Wave? That certainly does look like him. Although I can't say if this one is ripped from a movie or not, but I mean, let's see here. Is it gonna be like Cinderella? Well, 
if the shoe fits. Something about this cover though is that it looks drawn, but it also kind of looks like a photograph. Like are these people that are in the background actors posing for a pic, or are they also taken from somewhere else? Like who is this kid? Where are you from? He's from Roadhouse. That's hilarious. But you see, Arnold is also Conan the Barbarian, who is also Rastan. But you see, he's also in this game, and this game, and this game, even Golden Axe. He's even the Barbabar in Golden Axe. And then here he is looking like the Terminator on the cover of Mechanized Attack. But who's that other guy? Oh, it's the Highlander. There can only be one. But Arnold is also Jim Power. That's the Japanese Turbo Graphics art. But in the English one, he's Van Damme, who was also just a popular actor, whose movies also just got tie-in games as well. Ever play Time Cop? It's an okay movie, but it's a terrible game. Something about movie games, though, is that they would often just put the cover of the movie right on the cover of the game. Like Batman Returns, the Super version has like multiple stills from the movie in the background. This one just happens to be really good. But you would also often see tie-in games for any popular movie, especially children's stuff like Home Alone or all of the Disney movies. It was like every Disney movie also had a tie-in game. But Arnold is also in this game. I mean, that looks a lot like him. But then in the arcade version, we got these screens that parallel stills from him in the movies. I guess he's two people in this game. I didn't intend to have such a large chapter of this video to be about Arnold, but he's just in so many games. And then there's also all of the games that are just based off of the movies he's in. It's like he's got more games than Mario. Arnold for Smash. Alright, we got one more on the Turbo Graphics. And it's even the same knife. But who is this other guy? Oh, it's Rambo, of course. Because that's the other guy that's on a lot of games. He's in this game, and this game, and this game. And in this game, his likeness is on the guy in the back. But the guy in the front is doing his pose, but also looks a lot like Arnold. And then here we've got the pair of them again. And in this game, he's both characters. And in this game, it's like he's both poses, but the likeness of the other guy is again Arnold. Alright, so this game borrows a pose from Van Damme, but guess whose face that is in the background? Of course it's Arnold again. But you see, this one is truly special, because it was lifted from one of those Japanese energy drink commercials that Arnold was endorsing. Okay, so the Castlevania cover art slays just as much as the games do, but did you know that they were also heavily inspired by other artworks? Like, the background for this one is like ripped straight off the cover of a D&D &D book. And then the first game is so iconic with that epic stance and the castle in the background. But this also appears to be heavily inspired by a piece from Frank Frazetta, who is a legend in the history of old fantasy art. His stuff actually got ripped a lot by other game covers too. It certainly looks like even just this one pose got used a few times. Here's another pose that got used a whole lot. The sword even kind of arcs in the same way in all of these. Except for one, but in that one the two people are like in the exact same pose. And here's another pose by this guy that got used a couple times. Even the gauntlet arcade borrowed from this guy. The art on Atari games was often super cool to try to bait you into buying a crappy game. But some of those are stolen too. Like this one is stolen from another fantasy legend, Boris Vallejo. This one isn't even just inspired by. Like there's no way to spin this. Here's another one that's also very heavily inspired by one of his works. And this one is really obvious, but at least it's different enough. And then Pirate Adventure one for one stole the girl from another one of his works. And then the cover for this Dino Rex game sort of combined the two of these together. It's even framed the same way with that mountain in the background. What is this game though? I need to know.
Oh, it's like Primal Rage. How have I never seen this before? This game is ridiculous. I got lost in the sauce on this game, so you can enjoy the credits with me. Look at him go. This is amazing. But you know what's cool is that the guy who did these high fantasy pieces actually did make the cover for some Genesis games, like Echo the Dolphin, or Fantasy Star 4, and even Golden Axe 2. And then he did a cover for Golden Axe 3, but they didn't use it, and instead decided to redraw it for some reason, and then also put the Conan pose on there. Alright, so that's enough of the stolen art for now, although there is still plenty more of it that we could look at. But Bruce Lee is the target renegade, and Han Solo is in Chase HQ, right beside his partner, Lando. Alright, so this game, The Guardian Legend, has a box art that would make you think that it's an RPG? Well, it's actually a shooter. But it's pretty cool, because it's got these different perspectives between stages, and the Japanese cover art is way cooler. And I think it better reflects the idea of the game, because she like transforms into the ship or something. But I kind of imagine that this picture is like one of these face monsters that you fight in the ship levels. But also, this art was stolen too. Why would you steal cover art for localization when you already had this to use? Who knows? It is a really cool game though. So now I want to play a game with you. I'll show you the cover of a game, and then I want you to imagine what kind of game you think it is. We'll start with Mylon Secret Castle. Could be anything. Gives me Castlevania vibes. It's actually a cute mascot platformer. It's kind of like Mega Man, but with magic. And I think this is another instance where localizers were just afraid to put a cartoon character on the cover, because the Famicom art just has the main boy on there. How about Monster in my pocket? What is this, Pokemon? I mean, it's quite literally pocket monsters. Well, it's a platformer beat-em-up sort of game. And it's two-player. That's really cool. How about this other monster game, Monster Party? It's also sort of a 2D platformer action game. You're like a kid with a baseball bat, and then you can transform into a monster as well. Alright, Jewel Master. This looks really cool. That title makes me think it's a puzzle game. And there actually even is a puzzle game called Jewel Master. But this hand is also blasting at that phoenix. Which makes sense, because it's a platformer shooter kind of game. This game is one of my favorites too and you can beat it in about 10 minutes or less. Maybe I'll cover this one as a speed run. Okay, let's try Magic Sword. So what do you think about this one? Here's the Japanese art for this game, and here's an ad for it in Nintendo Power. It's an action platformer beat-em-up sort of game. This is also another really cool game. What kind of game do you think the Lawnmower Man is? To be fair, this one is also a movie tie-in but it's a platform shooter, and then it also has these first-person running segments, like if Mirror's Edge were on the Super Nintendo. King's Knight is one that I really like. What kind of game do you suppose this is? That's right, it's a rail shooter. What do you think about Eight Eyes? I think this game looks exactly like what it's trying to be, because it's sort of a Castlevania-type game. The skeleton and the bat are a really nice touch. We even got the castle in the background. How about Arkanoid? It looks like one of those rail shooters. Simultaneous two-player competition on screen. Oh boy, now I'm excited. It's a puzzle game. The super version also doesn't fit the full art on the box. If you saw it like this, then you probably could have guessed. This game is also a series and it was also an arcade game. If you saw this cover art, you would know exactly what kind of game this is. But what's the deal with this Andros looking guy? Oh, he's the last boss. Well, that's really cool. I always thought boss battles and puzzle games were a neat thing. Without seeing the puzzle frame, I would have expected this game to be something like Abadox. And the cover for that game just grabs your attention immediately. It's so colorful and trippy, and of course it's a shooter, 
But this game also delivers what the cover is selling you. This whole game is a trip. And the parallels between aliens and demons really helps to sell the horror. Another shooter game that you already know we have to talk about is Phalanx. This cover art is so iconic. I really appreciate a good high quality joke. You can probably guess that it's gonna be a rail shooter. First, we can see the ship right there, and they even spelled it out for us on the cover just in case. The hyperspeed shootout in space. And the name also really gives it away. The more X's and Z's you can fit into the title, the better. Just like prescription drugs. I think Zaxxon scores the most points with its name. But I think that Phalanx has one of those cover arts that immediately begs the question. Like I need to know. And Phalanx is actually one of the good rail shooters. I really like this one. Here's another game that really just begs the question. There are so many curious things here all at once. And then the name is very intriguing. Well, it's a board game. And there is actually a mule, so that's why it's called that. This is the NES game, but it was originally for the Atari, with another rather peculiar box art. Here's a really silly one. Shingen the Ruler. For whatever reason, they put all these abbreviation charts on the cover, but at least they only did that to the label on the cart, but also maybe it would have been better if they had put it on the box to warn people of what kind of game it was. Now, tactics games are probably my favorite genre, but the ones that are like this on the NES are so boring. It's no Fire Emblem, and I'll just leave it at that. How about Astian X? What kind of game do you think this is? It's got a name like one of those rail shooters, and you might think it's an RPG for obvious reasons, but it's actually an action platformer. Astyanax is also the son of Hector in the story of Troy. I always thought this game had a really cool cover art. Scheherazad. They knew you weren't going to be able to read that title font. And NES games got a lot of space for a really nice big cover art too. You know that the chip inside of these is only yay big? These big plastic cases they go in was just to be cool. Try to make this thing look like a cassette player or a VCR. So the Genesis games usually featured some really cool art too. But the ones that came in those bigger carts hardly had more than just a title or a logo. Even though the cases would have still had a whole art. But also most of those are from Electronic Arts. And they like reverse engineered the Genesis to make their own bootleg cartridges. But this Scheherazade art though, it could go right on an old magic card. Scheherazade is one and a red for a 2-2 creature with haste. But since it's an old card, it says attacking doesn't cause this creature to tap. There actually is already a real card called Scheherazade though. And it's a white card, spelled differently though. Anyhow, you probably could have guessed that it was an RPG. But I also could see this art being on a beat-em-up type game. Here's the Famicom art for this game. It's so cute. Gives me Dragon Quest vibes. And this is yet another example of Localizer's Xing cartoon characters. I think they're both good, just very different. I very much appreciate high fantasy art though. But can you actually do this high art thing for everything? And I think the answer is yes. I believe you can. Here's the Famicom art for this one. This one is even a cute game. And they gave Psycho Soldier the same treatment. But this art is also maybe stolen. Or at least heavily inspired. And this other Athena art looks like it was too. Great games, by the way. These are classic SNK titles. Here's a game where the localizers catch a fat W. Because here's the Mega Drive art. And this game is also just as sick as the cover art makes it look. How about this adorable game? How do you think they tried to market this in America? You already know. There is only one way to market video games in America. I'm surprised that this didn't happen to American cartoon characters that got video games. They didn't get the same treatment as localized ones. And because you really didn't know what a game was going to be like by looking at the cover art, Unless you were looking at a brand new game, because then you could just look at the back of the box to see some screenshots. But I bought a lot of used games, 
and all you got to look at is just the label. And because of that, I bought every Simpsons game, hoping that one of them would be a beat-em-up like that arcade game, but it was actually never ported to home console. Here's another one of those covers that leaves you wondering. What am I looking at? Oh, of course. Well, that makes sense. And here's another one that would fit nicely on a magic card. Uninvited is two and a blue for a 2-2 creature with unblockable. And this game is actually one of those point-and-click adventure games. Because it was really hard to know what you were in for just by looking at the cover of a game, the early NES box art would show honest graphics and in-game sprites of the game. And this was one of the things that they did to rebuild customer confidence into buying video games after the video game crash of the early 80s. Because video games would often bait you with a really cool box art like this, and then you would open it to play something like this. So that's why all of the first NES games have these now iconic cover arts, where they've got sprites of the games on them. We also have the games that just have a logo on them, like The Legend of Zelda. Just using a logo is a way to say that this game is important. And if the logo is really high quality, it's almost better that way. I mean, Zelda wouldn't be half as cool if it had one of those cover arts with the sprites on them. The Zelda cover arts that were just the logos always hit the mark. Even if you hadn't played a Zelda game before, you can very easily look at this and imagine what you're in for. But this game also got a lot of advertising too. And then all of the following games were like now a part of a legacy, so you already knew what it was. Faxanadu got a cover like that too. And sure enough, it's also an adventure game. Spectre for the Super Nintendo has a logo art that really captures the loneliness of a liminal space. Which is exactly what you feel when you play this game. Game show games always just put the logo on there. Like, you know what this is. If you've played one of them, then you've played them all. But every once in a while, you'd find one for a more interesting game show, like Double Dare or Nickelodeon Guts. These have like a shot from the show on the cover. There's a lot of places that a game for one of these could go. It's a shame that we never got one of these for Legends of the Hidden Temple. But we did get American Gladiators. How about Mortal Kombat? This is a really good logo. You already know what it is. And this game also got marketed like crazy. So you actually did know what this game was. Mortal Kombat was the talk of its day. But it's like every other fighting game had one of these covers with the characters doing poses or attacks. And keep in mind that back in the day, beat-em-ups were also sort of lumped together in the same category as traditional fighting games. Beat-em-ups used to also just be called fighting games. But you know when it's a fighting game. And I think that when you can tell what a game is just by looking at the cover art, then the artist has done a good job. An old wisdom saying is, a job done right goes unnoticed. My favorite box art out of the fighting games is this one for Ultimate Fighter. It's got that Hollywood localization thing, because here's the Super Famicom version, which would also be a lot more fitting, because this game actually has like a Saint Seiya thing going on. Puzzle games usually did a really good job of letting you know what the deal was. Except Arkanoid, but you already know about that one. The cover art usually featured the puzzle pieces in some way. This Bust-A-Move art looks really cool. But the localizers were again trying to hide the cartoon dinosaurs. Which is the best part, of course. Or like the Tetris Attack box art shows you exactly what this game is. But where the Yoshi Man at? Board games can also just slap their pre-existing art on their game covers. I mean, you know what it is. How could you make Monopoly any more boring? Make it a video game. But somehow, Monopoly Go is making millions of dollars. I think it says a lot about someone if they're playing Monopoly Go. Have you ever seen those guys that are playing this game on multiple devices at once so that they can get all of the rewards? 
please. Save safety for the rest of us. But it was actually mascot characters who were out there slaying them in the 90s. And of course the best way to market a mascot character is to just put that man on the box. You already know that all of these are platformers. And the character's name is either in the title or is the entire title. There sure were a lot of these back in the day, and they're all hit or miss. Some of them are really cool, however, a lot of them are also really bad. But the vast majority of these are at least passable. My favorite ones were those games featuring the mascots of non-video game products, like Cheetos or 7-Up, even Ronald McDonald's Treasure Land Adventure. Seeing a video game for a mascot of a product that you really like is so hype. It doesn't even matter how good or bad the game is. The sheer novelty of it is enough to sell it. Because even at worst, like even if the game is unforgivably bad, it at least stands as a good joke. But a lot of these are surprisingly fun. Like, a lot of these are actually better than most of those generic mascot character games. Do you want to play Bubsy or Cheetos? It's not even a competition. RPGs are also another genre that you should pretty much be able to identify right off the bat. Like the illusion of Gaia. If you see a world or a map like this on a cover art, it's probably an RPG. Now those high fantasy arts got used for basically every genre of game, but I always associated them with RPGs the most. Dragon Warrior was also one of those that got a high fantasy art rework for its localization. And if you didn't know, the art for Dragon Warrior, which was actually called Dragon Quest in Japan, was drawn by Akira Toriyama, the same guy that drew Dragon Ball. The American Dragon Warrior covers are really cool, but it actually might have been better to use the original art. It would have matched the in-game art style a lot better. All the ones on the Game Boy used the original art, and all the later ones did too. And then they also stopped calling it a different name in America. Chrono Trigger is of course an RPG, but they actually used our boy's art on the cover this time. It does have a different art than the Japanese version though, but at least they didn't work their localization magic on it. So the Final Fantasy games have these very beautiful and minimalist cover arts, and the Famicom games even came on these white cartridges to complete the look, but the localized versions of these games decided to not do that for some reason. You can still probably tell that they're gonna be RPGs, but what they did to Mystic Quest is really funny. They took the same art, but replaced the chibi character with this other guy. Cute characters not allowed. The D&D games always had these really awesome cover arts, and D&D art in general has always been really good. I mean, that is one of its big selling points. Even Castlevania was ripping it off. But the D&D games were pretty much always this. I mean, it's alright. What did you expect? The Immortal has this wizard guy on the cover. Very well drawn. This guy is two into blue, and has tap to deal one damage to target creature or player. But this game is actually really cool. I appreciate games with interesting perspectives. This game, Crystalis, has a really cool art. I actually bought this game just because of the art. It's also really cool to put a sword in the title. A lot of games did that, but it always works. In Japan, this game is called God Slayer and it has like an anime style cover. Secret of Mana also really portrays itself well as this grand adventure. The scene is beautiful, but it's the scale of the characters in this shot that makes the scope of its world look really big. Like you know this is gonna be a big game. Draken is another game that you just know is an RPG. I think the font really helps it as well. And just like a lot of other RPGs, you get a little bit of world building from the cover art, and I think that really helps to sell it. You get to peer into the world a little bit before you decide if you want to go there. We didn't see a lot of games with anime style cover arts during the cartridge days, but when you did, you knew it was going to be an RPG, like Lufia or Breath of Fire. And because of that, anytime I see an anime cover on a game, 
I immediately assume that it's going to be an RPG. And I'd say that still mostly holds true even in the modern day. So the Valis games are as anime as it gets. But the American Super Valis 4 cover is metal as hell. Dude is riding a tiger that breathes fire. But for real, this is the hottest thing that I've ever seen on a box art before. Atlas games get me excited. Sometimes the art on a game is just so totally radical that you just have to. Now this game is an RPG, and it had an anime style cover for the Famicom, but the American art looks like dance aerobics went to Narnia. Or Kid Chameleon. But look at the Mega Drive version. This tells you everything you need to know about how stuff was marketed between here and there. Or Dino City. This is peak 90s radical. This is the Japanese cover art. You already know what happened here. But the American art for this game is too good. And this thing where you spell each letter with a different font, 90s as hell. Treasure Master is another one with a cover art that is just too cool for school. Too bad this game isn't half as cool as it looks. The Angry Video Game Nerd even did a piece on it, so that tells you all you need to know about how good it is. Rival Turf is another game with a totally baller cover, and this game is actually good. This game is called Rushing Beat in Japan, and our boys are looking a lot older in this one. It's actually a series too. Brawl Brothers is another game in the series. I do like seeing American actors dressed up to kind of look like the characters from the game, but anime style fighting game characters also look super cool. How about Kid Nicky for the NES? He is the totally radical ninja after all. This cover art is totally rad, and I'm sure you saw this coming, but the Japanese art for this game features the cute character that actually looks like his in-game sprite. And then there's Radical Rex. Skateboards and dinosaurs? Hell yeah. I really want this game to be good, but it's just not. Alright, so the baby games. We've all seen them. Like the Mario Early Years games, or the Fisher Price games. Baby games usually do a really good job of reflecting who they're for. I mean, they're trying to market themselves as an educational game. But I got baited by Mario is Missing. It looked so intriguing. I thought it was gonna be like Mario RPG or something. But of course it was one of those educational games. And I should have known better after the first time, but I fell for it again when I saw Mario's Time Machine. These are hardly even games, but this part where you do the time travel thing is kind of cool. Another game that baited me really hard was this King Arthur game. I also thought it was going to be an RPG or something, but it's like a Lemmings game. With sports games, you pretty much knew exactly what you were in for. They pretty much all played the same too, but NBA Jam lets you know that it's time to slam. I'm not really into sports, but NBA Jam was so hype. Putting the logo on the ball like that, which is also tearing through the logo in the background, that's hype. And this one's on fire. And there were some other sleeper sports games, like this one, NBA Give and Go. Konami made this. You wouldn't think much about it because the cover just has some live photo on it, but it has this really cool pseudo 3D perspective. They should have just put the graphics of the game on the cover. And there's other sports games that had a really cool perspective too, but like, you would never know, because they always just use the most generic cover arts for sports games. But like, where do you place Ninja Golf? This is hilarious. But does it work with other sports? How about Super Ninja Street Cred Basketball? I made this one up, but Mecha Robot Golf was a real game. What makes this game really funny is that it's actually a reskin of some regular ass golf game. Localizers working their magic on everything. So putting graphics on the cover is also what they would do anytime a game had 3D models 
or 3D rendered sprites. Like Mario RPG did that, or Sonic 3D Blast, or Experts. If this game looks hilariously bad, that's because it is. The Clay Fighter box art says it all. You know exactly what this game is gonna be. But watch out for this guy. I'm bad. Call me daddy. Even Donkey Kong Country did that. But these 3D Donkey Kong covers are excellent. The second one is my favorite. But also, all of the Donkey Kong promotional art looks phenomenal. They need to make a 3D Donkey Kong game that looks like this. The technology is here now. But the Switch couldn't dream of running it. And when the 3D consoles came out, it was like just about every game was trying to put 3D models on the cover to show that it was a 3D game. I remember the Pokemon Stadium art being really hype, because battling Pokemon in 3D for the first time was a really big deal. But because it was so common with N64 games, finally seeing one without a 3D model on the cover made me instantly curious. Hexen was one of those that I bought just because the cover art made it look really cool. Deadly Arts was another one that really pulled me in with its box art. There were a lot of 3D fighters on the 64, but there aren't any others that I can recall that I've seen with an anime style cover art. I just think fighting game characters look really good in that style. But seeing everything in 3D was the hot new thing at the time. Like the Torok box art was so f <laughs> cool. I think this art really sold the game. Killer Instinct also had a killer art and the box had a different art than the label did. And the one on the Super also did the 3D thing to try and show off that it was going to have those 3D rendered sprites. So the Zelda games tended to do the logo thing, but Majora's Mask had this really cool hologram on the label. Only on the collector's editions ones though. The regular ones just have a flat sticker. Vector Man is one on the Genesis that used the 3D model on the cover, I think this art looks really cool. Vector Man was also Sega's attempt to be like what Donkey Kong Country was on the Super Nintendo with its rendered sprites, but on the Genesis. He also looks very different between his box arts and on the second game. Star Fox has one of the coolest approaches to box arts. I really like using props to take realistic photos. I think it really brings the atmosphere and builds immersion but also the texture. Modern movies and shows just don't have any texture anymore. All those old tricks that they used to do to add texture, like smoke or chain fences. Even the Power Rangers had this silky shine on their suits because it just looks good on camera. It's that texture. If you want to make something feel retro, just fill it up with lots of texture. I feel like the movies and photography of today are just way too clean. Everything feels so sterile now. And it's partially because resolution and definition have just gotten that good. But also, just about every movie is primarily filmed in front of a green screen. But the texture on that old Star Fox art is really nice. And speaking of the Power Rangers, they look really good on game covers too. The one with just the masks looks really cool. But I'm pretty sure that this was also the movie poster, which is again something that they did often for movie tie-in games. This was a game that I really wanted until I had it. But that's how they got you with those. Just put the movie cover on the game. Cutthroat Island was another movie game that baited me real hard. I actually didn't even know that it was a movie, but I probably could have guessed. I just thought it was going to be pirates. It's not great. It looks way better than it actually is. My friend bought this Mighty Max game because the cover for it looks awesome. And Mighty Max was also a pretty sick show. But this game was so bad that he just gave it to me. It was that disappointing. And then Super Strike Eagle was a game that I bought just because the cover art was cool. I'm not even into flight sim games, but this cover art made it look really cool and the Japanese version has this tasteful piece on the cover. Super Godzilla is another game with a super sick art, but this game is super not great. It's another one of those games that looks a lot better than it actually is. Putting super in the title makes a game sound super hype, 
and Super Nintendo games weren't the first to do it, but they did do it a lot to also play off the name of the console. Like Super Putty? I don't even know what I'm looking at, but it's Super, so let's see. This game is actually really cute. It's a good time. The Putty is indeed Super. How about Super Star Wars? Looks epic. I'm pretty sure that these cover arts are the same arts that were on the movie posters, but these games are also hella super. The Super Star Wars games are all really cool. Unlike the Star Trek games, which are not super at all, these games are as boring as it gets. Here's one on the Genesis, Super Thunderblade. This art is really cool. But what makes it even cooler is that it's actually a two-page spread if you open up the case all the way. The front and the back are two halves of a larger image. Also, hilariously enough, the title screen was ripped from a movie still. But this game is actually pretty super. I love rail shooters that use this perspective. It's dynamic. Just like the angle on that Super Mario Kart cover. This art makes the game look super fun. You got everyone all squished up in here having a good time, with such a dynamic view. I mean, look at that curvature. Mario Raceway kinda thick. Or all the Super Mario games. Super Metroid also has a super sick box art. The first Metroid had to do that NES thing where they put the in-game graphics on the cover, but Metroid 2 got a really nice art. The second Metroid game was also designed to be a flagship title for the Game Boy, like it was really meant to get people on the platform. Which is why there was never a second Metroid game on the NES. But that art for Metroid 2 got recycled for a re-release of the first Metroid game. But did you know that Metroid was a Famicom disc game? And it's got a really cool art too. The Shinobi games also had some really great cover arts, Except for this one. Is this why nobody bought the Master System? All the cover arts for this system are so... experimental. At least some of them, like Master of Darkness, actually put something nice on there. Which is probably my favorite game on the Master System. The Ninja Gaiden games also got crazy sick cover arts. And just like the Power Rangers, ninjas also just look good, pretty much no matter what the context is. With the first game, the localizers definitely win, although the Famicom art is still pretty cool. The second game actually has the same art for both, and then the third game has this weird anime cover on the Famicom. The Ninja Turtles games always had really cool box arts. This one was actually ripped off the cover of one of the comics. The Turtles in Time art is so sick though. They look so aggressive on the cover, but their in-game sprites are drawn more like the cartoon. However, in Tournament Fighters, their sprites actually look really gritty to match the cover. This one is kind of funny, because between the different versions, they used the same turtle face in the background, only swapping the color of the mask and the pair of guys who's fighting in the foreground. And they all have exactly the same name, but they're all completely different games. There's a lot of really cool box arts, with plenty more that I didn't cover, I can't say if there's one in particular that really stands out as the greatest of all time. And while I do feel like it's sort of a lost art in the modern world, cover arts still do their job quite well. Because the cover art of a game is a lot like the intro of a show. And you should be able to tell what a game is about just by looking at the cover. And the box arts of today are so optimized now. They may not be as cool as those hand-drawn illustrations, but they probably hit the market a lot better. Because the average consumer typically has a very low appreciation for art. And we actually still see a lot of the same tricks and styles of the old cover art used today. Like instead of drawing over movie stills, they just draw over the in-game graphics instead. I also think that it's really interesting how you can just about date a game solely by its cover art. Every era sort of had its own aesthetics and cliches, but what do you think? 